Okay, um, so welcome everyone to this uh, webinar this evening um, that we've called Global COVID-19 Vaccine Ethics, Access and Equity. Um, this is uh, hosted by us in the Swedish Society of Medicine's uh, student and junior doctor section, and we wanted to highlight the issue of global vaccine distribution um, because we feel like it's a very urgent and important uh, uh, global health issue that will affect uh, health in the world in general quite substantially in years to come if we don't uh, act upon it now. And um, very welcome everyone. Um, maybe you are watching on the Facebook stream now if that's come up or maybe you're watching here on Zoom. Um, we are, as I said, the Swedish Society of Medicine's student and junior doctor section uh, who are hosting this webinar. And uh, my name is Sixten. Um, I'm a medical student in Lund and uh, I'm also the public health secretary for the organization. Uh, I will also be one of the moderators for the panel discussion today. And with me, I have Hanna. Would you introduce yourself? Yes, sure, Sixten. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Hanna Jandal, and I'm an intern physician at the Umeå University Hospital, as well as a PhD student. And uh, I am the Secretary of Ethics for our organization, so Swedish Society of Medicine's student and uni doctor section. And uh, we also have a team uh, with us organizing this event tonight. So next up is Lucas. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Hannah and Sixten. So my name is Lucas Kreshnik Merck, and uh, I'm a medical student at Uppsala University, also part of the uh, Junior Medical Doctors Association in Uppsala. And I will be taking care of your questions tonight. And I'll pass on to Victoria. Yes, thank you. And uh, my name is Victoria, and I'm also I work as an intern uh, doctor uh, in Torsby in Sweden. And I will, uh, together with Lucas, also take care of your questions, uh, which you can submit through the Q and A section here and Zoom. So you can just leave your questions at any point on, like, if you have any questions on this issue. Just leave them in the Q and A, and we will try to bring them up some at some point during the the whole webinar when it when it's fitting. Um, and we we also have a very wonderful panel here with us today that we will be introducing quite shortly. But firstly, Hannah will just talk shortly about the Swedish Society of Medicine. So I see that some of you already know about the organization and are active. Um, but we are uh, an organization for medical students and uni doctors in Sweden. And um, we work with professional development uh, for medical students and uni doctors, focusing on global health, public health, science, ethics, education, e health, and quality. Um, and some people, they seem to think that we are the same organization as the, the union, but we do have some uh, work where we also look at the quality of education and such, but mostly we are doing the activities that we think are needed that are not the, uh, the areas or topics that are not brought up during medical education and things that we are really passionate about. Uh, so if you're interested in getting engaged, you're welcome to contact uh, any one of us after this webinar tonight. And for the next slide, I think it's uh, some short information on how to become a member. Exactly, thanks, Sixten. So there are a few pros. Um, you can apply for funds and scholarships. Uh, there's a reduced fee for several different seminars and conferences. Uh, you can apply for prizes and research, ethics and debates. And um, uh, you can access all of this for just 50 kroners a year as a medical student or 350 kroners a year as a junior doctor, or RTF, as we say in Sweden. So, with no further ado, uh, we will introduce tonight's panelists, our excellent guest speakers. 
And first out is Anders Nordström. And I will invite you to introduce yourselves, uh, the position or role that you have right now, and just in one or two minutes, um, why you think this topic is important, uh, the global COVID-19 vaccine situation, um, access and equity. So welcome, Anders. I mean, I think it's it's quite obvious for everyone that we are right in the middle of the crisis and the, the vaccine, and I will speak more about that later, is of course one critical solution to this. Not the only one, but one critical solution. Uh, why I think also this discussion is important that in the past, I've been working on global health issues now for 32 years. It's been mainly about um, sort of them and us. Now this is something for all of us. We're living this across the world. So, I mean, in the international jargon, we speak about global public goods. Uh, so the vaccine is really an example of something that is needed across the world for everybody. The question is how we will then make sure we get the research, the funding, and also the access across the world in the most effective way from a public health perspective. So we have a totally different situation today that is no longer about low-income countries and high-income countries. It's about all countries across the world. And the vaccine is a very good example of how we now need to move to a different mindset in terms of how we work on global health issues. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Anders, uh, for those starting words. Uh, we'll now move over to Yuan. Uh, would you introduce yourself and also tell us about your how your how you feel on the, about this topic? For tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I am Johan van Schreb. I'm a medical doctor, a general surgeon by training, and I'm currently a professor in global disaster medicine at Karolinska Institute. I'm currently in Beirut on an assignment for the WHO. Um, I spent some time here during the autumn to uh, help uh, the ministry to uh, scale up uh, ICU beds for COVID care. Uh, and now I'm back a bit um, uh, and understanding uh, how the progress is on that. Uh, and uh, there's been a, a decline of, of patients, but it was very tough uh, in Lebanon just a, a, a month ago. So, uh, and of course, uh, here um, it's very important to understand uh, the issue of vaccines from uh, 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 not from a Swedish perspective, but, but from a global perspective. And, and I can echo a lot what Anders has been saying that this is really about uh, us together. And also uh, the failure of the current mechanisms we have, uh, even if we speak about solidarity, I think uh, uh, this issue of, of, of how to get together uh, and how to react as, as one world is really challenging. Uh, you know, this uh, the, the type of societies we have created uh, with uh, you know maximal capitalism and, and uh, it's for uh, everything is for sale and nobody thinks about the common uh, goods uh, for everybody. So I think uh, hopefully this could be a, a starting point for for a new um, mindset uh, of how to uh, uh, address uh, big problems. I mean. Still, uh, uh, neonatal death continues to be the main reason for, for uh, uh, mortality in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, while we know it's easily to address it, but it's not until this happens and, and, and we can see that COVID can also affect us that um, we suddenly start reacting. So um, this is a wake up call, uh, but th we don't have the mechanisms in place. And uh, I don't think solidarity um, uh, it will work. I think we need other mechanisms. We need more global governance to, to deal with this type of problems in the future. And I think uh, the vaccine issue is, is really uh, one of those questions that put this in the spotlight. And, and so I'm looking forward to this discussion. And also to all of you students and, and young doctors, it's great that you're engaged in this and, and we really need more people engaged in global health uh, in Sweden. Thank you so much, Johan, and you are highlighting a lot of important topics, and I think uh, we'll try to get back to that in the panel discussion. Um, but next up is uh, Margareta Wahlström. Uh, so you're welcome to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your reflections on the topic and why you think it's important. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hanna and Kristen, and thanks for inviting me to this conversation. I am. Uh, Currently, the president of the Swedish Red Cross, um, and uh, of course, then based in Sweden. And 
but I have also a background internationally in the Red Cross, but also in the UN. And I, I you know, I, on this COVID, the vaccine, um, the pandemic is like climate change. It's like a nuclear threat. It has no borders, no matter what you do at home to look after your own interests. It's not going to safeguard you against uh, uh, the threats around. So I think, um, you know, the, the starting of the pandemic was an extraordinary sad uh, image of the um, inability of our multipolar world to unite around an issue like this. And we, we can talk about geopolitics, lack of leadership, but in a situation like this, uh, to not achieve even the basic uh, cooperation across borders, I think has set us on the path where we are now struggling to uh, move ahead. So um, as uh, for your specific question about the vaccines, as Anders said, it's not the solution, only solution, it's one of many. Um, you know, I, I don't, I'm not the kind of person who always repeat, you know, that we have the 192 national societies, but I will do it for this purpose because it is a structure in the world that actually in this situation, I think we are more united than governments, unfortunately or fortunately. And we have set up for the Red Cross even an extraordinary effort to perform the services because public health community health, the old fashioned word of primary health care has always been one of three pillars of Red Cross work for the past 100 plus years. Uh, so in this situation, each national society mobilizes what their expertise and capacity. We have some very hospital based national societies. Of course, they can provide medical services, vaccination, immunization, but most societies are not. And they are then actually dealing with, with supporting um, and working with people that are absolutely most exposed and most vulnerable in society, which is the focus for us. So um, we have now in um, addition to what we've done all the time in working in protection, um, socioeconomic concept, trying to reduce the socioeconomic impact on, on the most vulnerable people but also added the vaccination element of it, which everything from public information to actually doing the vaccinations depending on the country. I think, I mean, I, I agree with you, Hans, solidarity is not going to work. And today um, at the G20 meeting in Rome, the two presidents of the International Red Cross bodies, the IFRC and the ICRC, and they are actually calling for a, a extraordinary effort, including the waiver of the um, intellectual property of the vaccines to enable it, uh, global distribu production distribution and, and equitable distribution to which, of course, the Red Cross can be a, a, a auxiliary in most countries. Um, and, and finally, also just say that the Red Cross has established itself also supporting the COVAX in, in, in advocacy, calling for, but also adding its effort in trying to ensure better distribution. But that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Marietta. Uh, it will be very interesting to hear more about the Red Cross uh, global work in this issue. And of course, the vaccine, as you say, is not a complete solution to this pandemic. Uh, and, but um, let's move on to Hampus, if I can. Oh, there we go. Uh, Hampus, will you also introduce yourself and um, maybe something about the topic as well, if you want to add something? Happy to thank you, Sixten. And of course, uh, Johan, Anderson, and Maget have already uh, said it all in terms of the, the massive challenges that we are facing in terms of uh, global access to, to vaccines, the promises it brings, but also the, <coughs> excuse me, the caveats, uh, both in terms of the fact that, yes, vaccines will help pave the way to maybe a new normal, 
uh, or, or putting an end to some of the more devastating effects of the pandemic, but it is not a silver bullet. We need a range of interventions um, uh, and the road to global access to vaccines is still uh, long. Uh, so we'll come back to that a bit later on. But I also just wanted to take the opportunity to, to thank the organizers for this opportunity to have this conversation. As a former president of the junior uh, doctor section within the Swedish uh, Society of Medicine, I'm particularly proud to have this uh, opportunity to, to, to talk uh, with you and, and to sort of uh, benefit from your excellent work uh, that, that, that is still ongoing. And I think the the angle that you've that you've chosen for this uh, event, looking at it from the from the perspective of of ethics, uh, of 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 the right to health, almost as a as a sort of fundamental baseline right for all human beings, is is absolutely uh, the right perspective uh, to to use. Uh, there are some tough questions for. For governments, I mean, I, I'm right now, I'm a medical doctor by background, as you can see in the slide, but I'm now working uh, for the government, for the, for the government uh, of Sweden uh, and the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Uh, but indeed, uh, governments around the world are, are faced with, with very challenging questions around uh, how to square the circle between uh, uh, supporting your own population and the health of your own population and uh, contributing to the global uh, uh, to, to global health, essentially, and as you once said, uh, it's more and more obvious that we are talking about global public goods. Where even if we try to to help ourselves, uh, that is never going to be enough. We have to help others in order to even help help ourselves when it comes to vaccines, but also many other uh, health issues on the agenda today. So thank you again for this opportunity. Yes, um, you're most welcome, Hampus. It's really uh, great to have you back as a alumni from the from the organization, and welcome to everyone else uh, in our wonderful panel. Um, let's see. Um, as you can tell, we are all Swedish-speaking uh, people, but the plan of the event was to have an even more international approach with getting some international panelists as well. However, that was quite hard to manage, but we hope that to some degree, the very big experience from international work that we have in this panel can compensate a bit for that, but we understand that it's, it, it's a, it would have been better if we could have had more perspectives from people from all over the world. But we do believe this will be a very interesting uh, discussion nevertheless. Um, so here is a quick agenda. Since we had some technical issues at the start, we are running a little bit behind, but that won't be a problem. I think we will have plenty of time for our panel discussion at the end anyway. Uh, we've now done our presentations and we will continue with a sort of introductory presentation by Hampus with the aid of Anders Nordström uh, on the topic and the current situation. Then we are planning for a short break just to catch the breath. And then we will dive into the, the main course of today, which is the panel discussion at the end with all our panelists. Okay, so that's time for, for your presentation then, Hampus and Anders, and take it away. Thanks a lot. I'll, I'll kick it off and I think Anders will uh, uh, probably add on uh, in, in a few minutes, but uh, let, let me get started with one of my favorite uh, pictures. I don't know if anyone can, can guess uh, what, what, what it is you're seeing, um, but indeed this is what's called a zip line. This is a uh, drone, unmanned aircraft delivering vaccine doses from the COVAX Global uh, Vaccine uh, Corporation uh, in Ghana, the first country uh, in the world to receive doses from COVAX in the end of February this year. So um, 
this is sort of the 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 start of of this uh, quick uh, overview of the of the current situation when it comes to global vaccine access. Now, the current situation is first of all we need to bear in mind that we are still very much in the middle of a pandemic. Um, these uh, numbers uh, are always sobering. I mean, we've we've seen uh, decreases. Uh, at the beginning of this year in terms of the number of cases and also the number of deaths that which you can see here in the uh, uh, in the line is, is the number of deaths here. Uh, <clears throat> but unfortunately, in the past couple of months, we've really seen uh, an unprecedented increase again in uh, cases. Uh, you can see that that a, a, a large chunk of this is coming from uh southeast asia from india uh, in particular so you can see that that really we've we, we're facing a, a different uh pandemic today than than uh, than we have previously you may have also seen that this week's economist uh, maybe I've, I've misplaced it but it's it's it was here somewhere um this, this week's economist uh, actually provides an estimate of the potential actual excess number of deaths in the world. You can see here that the, that um, we are at some something like, it's hard to summarize, but we're at something like 3 million or 3.3 million deaths in the world. What The Economist showed this week was that we are in fact probably closer to 10 million uh, excess deaths due to the pandemic in the past um 12 to, to 14 months <clears throat> the light at the end of this uh quite sort of uh, depressing tunnel is that we have seen a completely unprecedented scientific global collaborative effort in terms of developing a new uh, or a number of new approved safe effective vaccines in less than 300 days the previous, the previous world record was for, for uh, uh, measles back in the uh, 50s and 60s. Then it took 10 years to, to go from identifying uh, the actual agent to, uh, to developing a vaccine. This time, as I said, took less than a year. This is an absolutely phenomenal achievement which was made possible both by the sharing of information by scientists around the world in China and elsewhere, um, but also thanks to unprecedented scientific efforts that have happened over many, many years, of course, as you know, uh, be before this pandemic um, uh, hit. It's also been made possible through huge investments in vaccine access, um, but a challenge and a consequence partly of those investments uh, has been uh, an unequal distribution of the, the of the vaccine doses that have actually been produced. So we'll come back to that in a bit. Today we've seen delivery of about 1.5 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines delivered to over 200 countries in the world. This this too is of course unprecedented. This is the world's largest mass vaccination campaign uh, in in the history of of mankind. Uh, um, but the the picture is uh, challenging. I think this this color uh, scheme maybe doesn't do justice to the to the reality of the injustices in terms of access to vaccines, with extreme discrepancies between some of the richer countries, with maybe a third of the population having received at least one dose, and the poorest countries, with some countries, in fact, not having received any doses at all. In, in most cases, that is because those countries selected not to receive any doses. But uh, but we even in those countries that, that opted to actually receive doses, the number of vaccinations per capita uh, remains, you know, something like one hundredth of that in the uh, in the richest countries. If we look at the total global picture from uh, from uh, a few days ago, um, you can see that many of many doses have actually been given. In when we talk about the total volume in in China and India, um, in, in in Asia, but then also United States and uh, um, 
Latin America, and then and then here you have in Canada, and then you have on the right um, uh, the European region. Uh, as you can see, Middle East and Africa has a very very small proportion of the total global uh, number. There have been some estimates to try and uh, estimate how how long will it actually take to vaccinate all. Uh, or the, the majority of people in each country, and, and, and the picture is quite bleak. Um, I'm hopeful that it won't take as long as this picture makes it out to be, but um, uh, this, this has been an estimate by The Economist. Um, and why is that such a big problem, one uh, can ask? I mean, from an ethical and human rights standpoint, it's of course uh, completely uh, against the principle of human rights and the, and the right to health to have such an inequitable distribution of something that can prevent uh, poor health or even uh, death. And for Sweden, as, uh, as, as, a, as a country of the world, uh, global solidarity, of course, is an important objective in and of itself, but also to maintain uh, our standing as a, a strong partner for countries around the world and a strong supporter of the multilateral world order. But there are three other really important uh, uh, arguments for why we need global vaccine access. Number one, um, as, as long as we have uh, uh, the virus circulating uncontrolled uh, around the world, the risk of mutations, of variants uh, uh, emerging of this, vac of this virus uh, uh, increases. So, so we need to vaccinate in order to decrease the risk of mutations and variations of the, of the virus, which can then strike all countries including Sweden. Secondly, the only way to really recover the, the world economy um, is to stop the pandemic through uh, vaccination. And, and, and thirdly, of course, we see, and, and this has been reported by many news outlets as well, we see the risk of um, a vaccine diplomacy being used to push specific agendas uh, using the vaccine as a, as a tool. So we're, we're facing a historic challenge. In a normal year, the world produces something like five or six billion vaccine doses for all uh, conditions, uh, all, all types of vaccines, mainly uh, child immunization programs, but also other, other things. Um, this year, we are trying now to produce an additional, on top of the five billion, an additional 12 plus uh, billion doses to cover the world, world's needs. Uh, the good news here is that we've already produced, as we saw, something like 1.5 billion doses. Um, we are actually actually seeing an expected production this year of of some somewhere north of 10 billion doses. So there's a there's a shortfall of about two billion doses, and the challenge is how to distribute uh, this expected production, which, <clears throat> in another analysis from the Economist, you can see comes primarily from Sinovac, which was just recently uh, approved by the World Health Organization as one of the handful of vaccines with, with emergency use license by the World Health Organization. Um, also Novavax, which has been a bit delayed, uh, but we're hoping to see uh, uh, being approved quite soon. Um, and then you can also see the other um, more familiar uh, names in, from a Swedish context, which is Pfizer, BioNTech, AstraZeneca, Moderna, uh, and Johnson and Johnson, further down uh, in this uh, figure. As you, as you've probably, you know, uh, heard from from uh, the media reporting, producing vaccines is a hugely complex process. It involves a number of different steps. Um, uh, you know, all the way from the development, clinical trials to the approval, manufacturing, the transportation, cold storage, delivery, vaccination campaigns, and indeed uh, ensuring that, that, that there is sufficient uh, will and interest uh, from the population to, to receive the vaccines, which is something I'm sure Margareta will touch on this, uh, which is a, you know, a huge challenge to actually get people uh, to, to, to want to be uh, vaccinated as well. Um, this manufacturing uh, process is, is 
additionally complex because it's it's an incredibly international one that that often involves transportation of of different components of vaccines from different parts of the world to other parts of the world and maybe back again and so on. Um, there are a number of producers in Sweden producing different components of vaccines, for example. Uh, so an important point here is to keep borders open to the full ex fullest extent possible and completely open uh, in order uh, for vaccines to be able to be uh, produced effectively. The facility that's been created to try to uh, fill the gap and try to assist the uh, 92 poorest countries and low and lower middle income countries, uh, which was launched uh, sort of mid mid 2020, but then formally created uh, towards the end of the summer last year, um, is called COVAX, um, the COVAX facility. And um, uh, it has two components, two arms, one of which is, is to uh, purchase vaccines for, uh, for, for low and middle income countries. The other one is for countries to actually purchase their own vaccines for their own uh, populations. Um, the total need for, for COVAX to procure, to buy doses for 20% of the population in the 92 countries is um, about 8.3 billion US dollars, and there is still a remaining need of, of somewhere around 2 billion US dollars right now. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at 6, 10. If I still have time, I'm going to, to just provide you with a couple of uh, uh, reflections on the Swedish efforts um, uh, in, in this uh, race to, to provide the world with vaccines. And, and the reason I have chosen these two icons is that we tend to talk about the need for dollars and doses. Uh, we need both funding and, uh, and doses uh, to be able to vaccinate the world. Sweden was one of the uh, one of, was early uh, a, a sort of early uh, a strong international voice in terms of the need for for global access to vaccines already in uh, July last year, as you can see here. Uh, the Swedish Prime Minister, alongside a number of other world leaders, published an op-ed in, in Washington Post to the effect that we, we need uh, to ensure vaccines are available globally and it's, it's in everyone's best interest. Um, so we've continued to provide political support from the Swedish government to this process through political declarations at, in, in, at the UN in, in New York, uh, but also um, this uh, resolution at the UN General Assembly, uh, sorry, at the at the Human Rights Council in uh, Geneva, uh, and also in a number of other declarations and and political statements. But words are, of course, not enough. So I'm glad to to say that Sweden has also been able to to walk the talk in terms of the dollars and doses. So um, Sweden is today the world's largest contributor to Covax relative to the population, uh, roughly each. Each person in Sweden, through uh, through taxes, basically is provided 240 crowns uh, to to Covax. Um, that's roughly equivalent to the cost of vaccinating each person in Sweden. So um, I think that's a number we can be be proud of. But but still, as you saw, Covax has a long way to go in terms of mobilizing the funds needed. <clears throat> Part of the solution to do it, to being able to provide so much funding, 2.5 billion. Swedish crowns is, is that we are able to, to make payments over 10 years, even though COVAX receives the money up front through an innovative financing mechanism. Um, <clears throat> um, but in terms of the doses, Sweden has committed already to donate 1 million vaccine doses to, to COVAX. Um, uh, but there will be a, an even larger surplus, as you've probably heard our national vaccines coordinator talk about uh, if you follow Swedish media, uh, but also in the international media, this is a, a, a very common discussion topic, not least because of um, President uh, Joe Biden's announcement just yesterday that he was going to donate 80, 80 million vaccine doses, partly through COVAX. Um, we've also supported uh, efforts to increase transparency and, and combat uh, corruption in relation to vaccine rollout. I think there are a number of uh, challenges ahead in terms of fully funding COVAX, ensuring that the rollout is safe and effective, to, to grow manufacturing capacity, or ensure all doses are actually being used, 
terms of managing virus variants and duration and, and, and monitoring the duration of immunity, will we need booster doses, for example? And lastly, in terms of building and maintaining trust in vaccines. I will uh, stop there and hope that Anders will uh, add some points from his side. Thank you very much, Hampus. This is the danger of being on leave, that somebody is just taking over and also taking all your minutes that you have to speak. So I will just sort of say two words. Uh, very good presentation, Hampus. Very, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm presently on leave as, from my role as the Swedish um, Ambassador for Global Health, and I'm leading the Secretariat for what is called the Independent Panel on, prepared, on Pandemic Preparedness and Response, and we just came with our report last week. And I think most of you have seen it. Um, the panel is then making a strong now key case call uh, for immediate action when it comes to two things. One is the redistribution of already existing or contracted vaccine doses. Uh, as Hampus said, uh, 10 billion doses in the pipeline for this year. Countries that have already contracted vaccine doses have contracted for 200% of their populations. That is 100% too much. So that could be redistributed now. The panelists challenging the world and say that by 1st September, 1 billion doses should be redistributed. Either doses that countries have, or even more and better, just make sure that you transfer the contracts, which I know is easier said than done, but that just needs to be solved. So the US contributions now of 80 million, Swedish 1 million, that is 81 out of 1 billion that we set at the target. And recognizing what is in the pipeline, the panel believes that 1 billion is possible if the political will is there. And we hope that that sort of movement now have started. But the second call the panel is making is, is also for starting local production now. Responding to President Kagame in Rwanda, who is ready now to set up a plan to produce vaccines in Rwanda. And it's not just about now the TRIPS waiver and having the intellectual property rights now being waived. That is one step, but that's not going to be enough. You need to have the technologies. You need to have the technical support. You need to have the money to invest in those plants. You need to have people. You need to have the logistical system to actually be able to produce. And then even more importantly, also have the people to be able then to basically to vaccinate people and to make, people, make sure that people would like actually to receive the vaccination. That is an issue across the world today, that there is a lot of hesitance also actually to immunize. Uh, so the panel is making those recommendations, saying that this is a priority, but as I said initially as well, that what is needed now is not to think that the vaccine is the solution. It's part of the solution, an important solution. But you need to continue with the non-pharmaceutical interventions as well, but also recognizing that this crisis is more than about the virus. It's more than about um, just thinking, as long as we can vaccinate, then we are done. What the panel has found is also that inequalities has grown, People that were out protection in terms of access to basic health cares, they are now even at the worst situation. People that were left without a job, without job security, without salaries, are much worse. The gaps in between people have increased. So the panel is also making a strong plea and call to say that this is something that is more than just controlling the virus. You need a reset of the international system. So the panel is coming up and I will just say one word about seven recommendations for the future. Establishing a global health threats council at the highest political level established by the UN General Assembly with heads of states, but also including civil society and private sectors to ensure that there is political momentum, political responsibility taken this time, which has not been the case in the past. Despite numbers of recommendations, they have not been implemented. This time that must not happen. The panel is also calling for a special session of the United Nations General Assembly for a political declaration, basically to get the heads of state to confirm, to commit to what is now needed. They may also make a strong case for a stronger, more independent, but more focused WHO, more authority to WHO, but more focused in terms of what the organization is doing. But giving them authority to publish information about suspected outbreaks when it it's no, not waiting for the government to approve. They also, we also make a case now to invest in preparedness now, not when the crisis hits next time. But then there are two major recommendations that is also relating to the access of vaccines. 
The panel is recognizing that the COVAX and the broader architecture, which is called the Act A, has been very successful, big picture, if you take a step back, but it's not good enough. So there is a need for a more in-depth evaluation to see how one can ensure that that platform is there also for the future, both to be able to get research to production, to financing, to access. Again, if we look back, we see the frustrations and the shortcomings, but we should also see the success, what this actually has delivered as campus per se. But for the future, we need to rethink what we need in terms of platform. And the second one is then in terms of financing. The panel is making recommendations to establish a new international financing facility. Opt, not a new global fund. The financing facility to raise money based on ability to pay formula. The countries that can pay most, pay most into a facility that potentially can be hosted by IMF to finance functions of the existing international system for global public goods and for money resources needed for low income countries for partners. Uh, the panel's recommendations comes as quite a tall order, both in terms of the analysis, what the system and what the international communities and national government failed to do. Uh, but it comes also now as a package of recommendations that will create, we know, quite a lot of political debate and discussions, but the panel believes that this package could actually prevent the next outbreak from becoming the crisis we have today. Thank you. That was shorter than you have, wasn't it? Thank you. Impressive. Thank you so much, Anders. And um, we have also shared uh, the link to the report uh, from the independent panel in the event. Uh, we will share it here also in the chat. And I also saw that there was um, like a summary now published in The Lancet for those who can't read the whole report at once. Um, so we'll share them with the participants here. Oh, there, is, there is a comment in The Lancet, then there's a summary of the report published as well. But today there's also a paper in The Nature published uh, reporting on the 28 country studies that we did that was published. No, no, it was published yesterday. But what I would recommend as reading is what we call the 13 defining moments, which is sort of the story, 13 chapters. That is my favorite reading. If you like, just to reflect on what happened and some of the conclusions that we draw. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great suggestion. And perhaps something for our next journal club with the organization, actually. Uh, but with that, we will give you five minutes break and we'll be back at 1920 for the panel discussion. So stretch your legs, take a glass of water and um, do write all of your questions here in the Q&A box because we are eager to hear what you want to know uh, and what you would like to ask the, the panelists. So see you again at 1920.
All right, so I hope that you are all back. Now it's 20 past and uh, we have got a lot of questions here. Uh, we will continue until uh, eight o'clock uh, and um, please continue to send in your questions uh, as we go along. Um, we have Anders, Margareta, Hampus and Joan with us. Perfect. Okay, I can see you all. So we'll start off with um, quite a general question and I'll direct it to Johan at first. So why after, after this introduction and, and what you already said, why is equitable vaccine access important? Well, I think it has been answered that it's a, it's of global uh, concern. Um, so that's clear. I think the challenge here is to, uh, I mean, vaccines, we can understand the use of it, but we have a problem here uh, in terms of access to care when, uh, we, when, when uh, patients fall ill in COVID. Um, uh, we have lack of access because people cannot pay for services. And I see this here in Lebanon where people actually uh, cannot afford to seek care. And if they seek care, they need to pay for the medication. Uh, I was at one of the hospitals, public hospitals today, and uh, they, I tried to get a list of what do the patient needs to pay for if they're seriously ill. So um, with high flow oxygen, the patient needs to buy the mask for $100. Uh, and then depending on medication, um, if they want, uh, you know, Remdesivir or Actembra, they need to pay for those uh, services. They need to pay for uh, all extra things. Um, and that is simply not affordable for most people. So most people will actually stay at home until they're extremely sick. And then maybe as a last attempt, they will come to the hospital. Uh, we see this happening now in India uh, where there is uh, queuing up to come to the hospital. So. I think vaccine on one hand, uh, we can see the value of it, but let's not forget clinical uh, care of those that are uh, sick, not only in COVID, uh, but also in other critical conditions. And I think it seems very difficult for us to hold several um, problems in the air in parallel. And the risk here with focusing everything on vaccines is that we forget the rest. So. Um, uh, and this is very challenging, obviously, uh, to, to also uh, remember clinical care of those uh, sick, of, of uh, uh, the pregnant mother who has to give birth, etc. cetera. Um, so um, the challenge really here is to not uh, make it to one disease uh, project, but as a catalyst uh, for change to, to get access also to, to clinical care. So uh, I would see that um, on one hand, it is important for us in Sweden that people are vaccinated around the world, but it might not be a priority for them. And I discussing with, with um, patients or, and people here in, in Lebanon, especially among the poorer uh, uh, segment, they uh, have so many other issues to deal with uh, that they think vaccination against COVID for them is a minor problem. And it seems based on my experience also from Ebola, it's not until your neighbor, your relatives fall ill in COVID that you see this as a real threat also to you. And uh, it was not until the population realized that in, in Sierra Leone that, that behavior started changing and the community um, got engaged. So I think it's now it is, we are very much in a top-down position where we are mobilizing these vaccines and we, we are sort of, um, uh, we, we, we think that people will be ready to take it, but here in Lebanon, only 20% of the population has actually registered uh, to get uh, the vaccine. So I think we have so much more work to do uh, from the bottom, so to say, from, from uh, the uh, population perspective. Uh, I think it's great that we're moving along now uh, to mobilize vaccines uh, globally, but how uh, will we actually distribute them? Will it be uh, distributed um, uh, uh, and then uh, we will have, uh, it will be taken money from the normal budget, uh, like in Congo, for example, you have $16 per capita for healthcare. Can you take money from those $16, which is 650 times less than what uh, is available for healthcare per capita in the United States? How can we make sure that this vaccine, vaccine campaign 
it's not going to erode the, the full budget of uh, the ministries of health that are already severely underfunded. Um, those are questions. I mean, it remains um, uh, logical uh, for, for at least for us to, to think that, that uh, everybody should get vaccinated, but we need to understand better. We need to get a buy-in from the community, um, especially in countries where there is no trust here uh, uh, the population in Lebanon, the, the government, they, they, they refer to the government as hell's angels, basically, that are not to be trusted. They just steal, they are corrupt. So why should we follow what they say that we should be doing? We have not received anything from them except from them stealing our money. We had this explosion last year. So I think um, there's so much more work to be done to build trust, to get people to accept vaccines and also to see it not only that they... Um, participate in global solidarity by taking the vaccine, but also to get them to understand that it's actually something that they may need. And we need to convince them, meaning that we also need to be there when their child uh, gets malaria or uh, when uh, measles vaccinations are uh, stopped because of conflicts. So there's a significant challenge here to use this as an opportunity to um, boast um, uh, other types of, of interventions, preventive and curative, but let's not forget those. And I think that is uh, uh, the biggest danger, I think, here with, with the rolling out vaccines, that it will steal all the attention, it will steal funds, it will take resources. But uh, that is the challenge of maintaining several uh, uh, challenges uh, and addressing several ch challenges in parallel. So I, I think uh, uh, this is, is something to remember that we are still, even if we mobilize all these vaccines, that is not, it's still not uh, um, making sure that, that people will receive and, and take them and appreciate them. Um, uh, it's, very, it's very fascinating to be here. You know, they lifted the, um, the, the curfew here and you know, within one day, people, everybody was out on the street, uh, crowded, not wearing face masks anymore. So people really think here in Lebanon, as the cases have dropped quite significantly, that this is over. I'm trying to say to all the hospitals that I've been visiting, there's going to be a second wave because that we know for sure, because the vaccination level is very low, around 5%. And you know, all uh, the, the data we have suggests that there will be a second wave, but people just shake their ha head and say, no, 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 we have uh, immunity. We have herd immunity now, and we can go back to normal life. And so there's so many issues we need to address. So let's not think about it as a silver bullet. It, it's another tool in our toolbox, but we need to have so many more tools and let's not make it, uh, this tool take the, the whole space in our toolbox. Thank you for broadening the discussion with all of these different aspects, Joanne. Uh, the clinical for one, but also about um, uh, previous vulnerabilities that now have shown uh, in a, in a new way during this pandemic or a syndemic as some people choose to call it. Um, and also about the access to health, which is, uh, as you all know, still an issue also is in Sweden for some specific vulnerable mm. groups, uh, not to forget. Uh, and of course the trust, the trust issue and how we as uh, medical workers come in, in a specific situation, in a specific um, uh, area, and um, how we work on that if we don't have this ongoing work all the time, the maintenance. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, it's something that we've seen also a lot in the Ebola work, right? The trust issues with the local communities. Um, but once again, so important. But I'll invite Margareta to speak your mind on, uh, on this aspects of, of the importance of equity in vaccine access, but also in general in the COVID-19 response? Mm -hmm. well, I think uh, I pick up on many of the issues that Johan just uh, uh, talked about. And uh, because it, this is the experience in every disaster, and I've been through many in decades now, this inability of us to keep more than one thought in our mind as we act. Uh, um, and I. I you know, I think there are good explanations why this, but it also hampers us. And I, when I listened to Anders uh, Nordström, and the, no, it was, uh, hum yes, Anders on the report and the WHO recommendations. 
as Anders also mentioned, some of them are definitely not new. And uh, in my mind, I say, well, how, how can we make sure this time that it will work? What, what, is, what is the trigger now? Um, and we have discussed uh, actually quite a lot around um, the trust issues, the ability to reach out in communities. And um, when Hamper said that it looks like a long time before the immunization we reach certain parts of the world, that is not equitable. But even within countries, we are not going to reach population. You mentioned Hanna, also Sweden, and we know, and we meet them at the Swedish Red Cross, and we have a, we have a clinic for um, paperless people that they can come here and we can support them to exercise the, the legal right they have to emergency health care in Sweden. But how do you reach people who are homeless, uh, who uh, um, actually have not had food to eat for the day? And I have heard it, uh, I've heard people say, well, you know, before I die from COVID, I will die from hunger. So how do we manifest now when we are in the phase that actually vaccine is becoming available? when we will assume there is a political commitment to ensure that the, sort of the 50 countries in the world today that have received 2% uh, of the available doses uh, and the other 50 that have taken the rest of it, so to speak. How will we actually um, be able to link up with that last mile where um, community have distrust of the government, uh, where there maybe there is not yet any proper community education campaign. Uh, can this vaccination be in, uh, included in the integrated vaccine programs that are going on for many other diseases, existing local infrastructures? Um, and who is going to do all that work that is not global, but even national and local? And uh, you know, the issue, Johan also talked about the access to healthcare and all the payments and depleted health systems, which even before the pandemic, I think is a major issue. But now we also have to include the way we have acted in many countries. Um, we have to include um, this depth to the future of loss of health or chronic diseases and, and uh, other potential uh, emergencies. So how how you know can we have this dialogue with governments and I'm, you know i hesitate to say it but how can we get beyond the panic and become more rational about what we do which i think is what the who report or the panel's report in a way is trying to tell us extend the perspective beyond this very acute sense of that we are all exposed and we are all endangered. And, and of course we are, but I think some of us a bit less than others. Uh, so thinking about communications, um, um, and I think in, the, in this issue of ethics, what is morally right, what is equitable, uh, the communication is really a critical point because we say it's in also in our interest that the rest of the world is vaccinated because then we are safer. Yeah, um, but that doesn't seem to convince people who are against us sharing our vaccine doses with the other countries in the world. That that argument doesn't work on them. So, you know, any thoughts uh, from the panel or from you or from those who are listening to us, how that communication can be targeted so, so that we get people with us, all of us have met, I'm sure here in Sweden, standing in these famous queues to get your first uh, job. And you see people leaving the clinic because they don't like the vaccine they are offered. When others say, you know, just give me a vaccine, whatever. So how do we get a ba better balance between, uh, I think that, that's the conversation and the communication um, that I would like to see us developing also and, and move with gradually, deal with pov increasing poverty issues, um, deal with also uh, the parallel health issues, 
deal with the obvious inequities within communities that have increased so quickly over here. And as you've all seen in the middle of this absolute catastrophe in India because of the COVID, they also have cyclones hitting them and, uh, and taking away livelihood, destroying communities. We have ongoing conflicts where it's very hard to say how COVID has hit Yemen and other conflict areas because, you know, people are filling up in hospital or they don't go there, as uh, Johan said. So um, when we begin to be able to look at this in a fairly structured way, I think we will also be able to deal with the equity issues and speak to it in a, in a, in a fair way. Um, and all these issues that we're talking about here, but I'm, you know, I would always like to hear if I can put the question to the panel. <laughs> can I, you know, uh, Anders, you must have discussed a lot when you did the report, um, because you know, you know the, the the consequences of many recommendations. What were the most critical ones that you would see us also to advocate in support of the panel conclusions? Where should we start? That's my question to Anders. <laughs> Did you catch the question on this? Sure. <clears throat> no, I can come in. Um, I mean, if I start with Margareta's question, where to start and how to make it happen this time. Um, I mean, the panel did a lot. One of the first thing was to review 16 previous commissions reports and basically founding that, that most of what was recommended was not implemented. So that is our first background paper that is published. Um, I got this question earlier on today, why then we can't just take one of the previous reports that was about Ebola or HIV AIDS even, and just replace the word of a previous disease now with COVID? And my answer was no. What we have at hand today is something totally different. And hopefully that will mean that we can also get political decisions this time. Uh, one can say that this is a virus like other viruses, but the implications here, and that goes a little bit to what Johan was saying in terms of, the inequalities, uh, but also recognizing the impact much wider than just the impact of COVID being sick or dying from that. What this pandemic has disclosed are the inequalities in societies, um, but not just within societies in countries, but also in between countries. And we are living in an equal world. We have lived in an equal world for, for decades. But what gives me a bit of hope is that today uh, we are talking about it. And in some way, the vaccine for me is just a uh, a proxy indicator in some way for, for the system. But it's an interesting one because this time the demand is here. The demand is here that the world should have equal access. One shouldn't make a difference because the case now is also that no one is safe until everybody is are safe. So suddenly we begin now to, in some way, I mean, I recognize that if you look at the broader economic access to healthcare more broadly, it, there are many, many years to go before we are there. But still, we have a different kinds of situation today when it comes to actually recognizing the need to effective and equitable access to one, two. That could pave the way for other things. I was very encouraged some years ago when the uh, Rota uh, virus vaccine um, made, was become available. It was made available at the same time in Sweden and Rwanda, but at different prices. So that was a good example where we were able then to manage different ability to pay in markets and having a new tool out. But of course, the vaccines are the easy things. The easy, in some way, the cheating ones. The real ones are the real health systems issues. And uh, as I said before, there is an article in The Nature published yesterday of findings in terms of how health systems cope. And the main issue here is then the integrations, well-functioning health systems, the one that had access to universal health coverage, where you paid according to your ability to pay, everybody's equal opportunity and right to health, they are the ones that did best. So there's no question about that. You need to address that broader agenda. But the bottom line here, I think still is then about this momentum now coming back to your question, Margareta, it's about political decisions. The independent panel's report is political. I mean, some people have been saying that it's not, it's not there was not enough of experts. We did a lot of consultations and we our reports are 
basically footnoted and there are references, etc. but it is political. This is not a technical report. And the target group here are the politicians. Uh, and we, begin, we believe that there is a momentum, but this needs to now get fully supported by governments like the Swedish government, but also by other governments actually to implement. We had an excellent call with the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, yesterday. Full support, like the report, like the recommendation, but there is a need now to get that traction across the world and making sure that some of us who've been in the UN system, that is not just sort of now torn into pieces by the people negotiating in New York and, and Geneva. So you need to elevate that. So that's our top priority, to get it at the highest level where people understand that we are in a major crisis, which is different from what we were in, in the past. And because of that, we need different decisions. Thank you very much, Anders, uh, for your uh, addition to that question. Um, it's definitely, as Margareta said, it's, uh, there's a difference between the rhetoric of uh, nobody is safe until everyone is safe and what is actually politically done in the world and especially by the countries with the resources and the ownership of the vaccines currently. Um, also, it's very, this very important topic of inequalities within countries and the vulnerable, vulnerable groups who are not, uh, who, are in, who even in Sweden, we are not able to reach uh, because of issues of communication, issues of uh, uh, skepticism towards vaccines, etc. Uh, so that's definitely a large challenge. Um, I would like to uh, dial back to uh, just the, the vaccine question, just one important um, discussion that is very highlighted at the moment uh, after the US uh, uh, sort of uh, went out with their support for the waiver wavering of the, um, the trips, the intellectual property rights for the vaccines. Because um, I'm interested if um, any one of you have any comments on if how important of an of a facilitator that would be for the uh, like for the global vaccine equity. Uh, Ampus, do you have any thoughts on this issue, for example? Thanks, Ixten. Uh, I mean, I think in, I think it's quite clear uh, that first of all, this is a this is a challenging and, and very sort of fraught issue with with uh, uh, good arguments on both sides. It's uh, it's an un, uh, almost unnecessarily polarized discussion, but. Uh, I think there have been some some excellent attempts at, at summarizing both sides. Uh, uh, I can sort of recommend uh, uh, th there's a, there's a summary provided by the Center for Global Development, uh, uh, Rachel Silverman, who's who's quite a good um, a expert at sort of summarizing the, the the different sides to this discussion. But I think we certainly all agree that number one, we need to we need to radically in increase production capacity uh, globally. Um, uh, we need to reduce trade barriers and ensure that there are, the, that, that uh, as I showed in my slides, vaccine uh, supply chains can, f can flow uh, freely so that there are no, um, so, so that vaccine production is not stopped by uh, export controls or any other such measures. Um, I think it's also, there's also a consensus that uh, it will it will take time for a potential waiver of of intellectual property uh, of the intellectual pro property framework uh, to actually ha have a potential effect, um, and and there is still controversy around whether uh, we would indeed see the 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 effects that we would like to see from such an initiative, um, uh, particularly given that. You know the, the effective examples that we have today, such as the, the licensed production of AstraZeneca vaccine in India and in the Serum Institute, um, uh, and, and others with similar initiatives uh, in, in the past, have all been based uh, on the principle of technology transfer, uh, of actually conveying, it's not, it's not enough to actually have 
the recipe or the molecule and the formula. Indeed, you need uh, the, the sort of tacit knowledge of how to uh, actually produce this. So I think there's a range of, of measures that are needed and that, are, that can be helpful um, in terms of scaling up local production, uh, capacity, capacity to produce vaccines and other drugs. Uh, I mean, in the in the same vein that Margareta and and Johan have have brought up the the fact that you know COVID is is one uh, among many uh, big health threats, uh, particularly in low and middle income countries, where uh, increased capacity to produce uh, vaccines, drugs, and other health technologies could go a long way to, to address some of those health challenges beyond COVID as well. So, so we need also to make sure that we don't sort of just focus on, on, on this one thing, although it, it remains our top priority uh, at the moment. And uh, I suppose since I, I in, in some way represent sort of the, the official government position, I, I have to say that the, the formal position remains the same uh, from the government that that uh, uh, the intellectual property system uh, is uh, necessary to, 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 to um, make innovation possible and, and, and should be sort of uh, maintained. So that, that, that remains the official position. That's uh, it's not, not, not my, my formal expertise or area of work, but that's the, that's the official uh, position, yeah. Thank you, Hampus. Um, is there anyone else in the panel who wants to add anything to this? polarized question of whether it's it's a long-term uh, positive or negative uh, idea but but just just to uh, reflect on that i think this is also an opportunity and uh, it is uh, i think financing for this needs to go much beyond uh, health it's an economic issue i think global trade is severely affected by this uh, crisis so I think um, we need to recognize that this is not uh, a health problem, but it's a societal problem. It's a global problem. And uh, financing mechanisms needs to be in place, not only uh, as a, a health problem, but, but for the whole uh, global system of, of, of trade, etc. So money has to come from additional sources. Not, let's not reduce this to a health problem. But I would like to, 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 to recommend uh, this book uh, to you uh, students to read. Um, it, it's a fantastic uh, 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 sort of uh, attempt to, to look on, on global uh, health problems. And really that, that the capitalistic system that, that is in place has failed uh, to address um, this type of problems. Uh, and uh, what, what Mariana Matsukato is, is trying to, to say is that we need like a capitalism 2.0 that uh, goes beyond greed, goes beyond uh, just earning money. It's, a, it's about the future. And I think we can include um, uh, uh, climate change and all the other challenges that are, are sort of threatening mankind. Uh, so uh, I think it's really essential that we see this uh, very rapid uh, uh, I mean, within one year, uh, this problem has, uh, of, uh, of, of COVID-19 has um, uh, affected uh, the world and, and we've come up with one potential uh, uh, solution, uh, which is sort of part of, of uh, several other uh, solutions. But uh, we need to somehow uh, rethink uh, how we uh, organize our societies and and also to make sure that it is not, it cannot only about, be about uh, greed and earning money that we, for the future, we need to invest in a, in a different kind of uh, global health order uh, or global order. Uh, and, and let's uh, uh, talk about the bigger issues about mankind, about how we're going to, to survive on this planet. And I think within one year, so much uh, has, has been put on the table suddenly and where we, were problems that have been there for a long time that we you know we make donate some money through uh, every month uh, uh, you know 100 crowns to this and that every uh, every month to 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 be uh, to show uh, uh, that we have ethics uh, and and we think about other people we give some money to msf and, and to other agencies but here we really need to rethink uh, and i think on the political level but also as individuals uh, this this uh, 
should uh, ask ourselves questions about the future. Uh, and in one year, uh, the, there was this problem, and then one sort of solution came up. Uh, uh, and the problem, uh, as, as has been uh, addressed by, by the previous speaker, that this is a global problem and, and we cannot reduce it to, 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 to a problem for, for the poorest. Uh, on the other hand, this is more of a problem for us than for them, as, as, as the current epidemic says. So in some way, we are uh, asking for their help uh, in low income countries to get vaccinated to save us. And that is a totally new world order. And that uh, it, it's clearly so that the systems we have in place are not, uh, and climate change, I think, is, is another issue that, that we should not uh, uh, overshadow. We need uh, different governing structures, but also rethink uh, uh, the systems that we are uh, part of. And of course, uh, capitalism has uh, helped us a lot. Uh, economies have grown, people have gotten out of poverty. Uh, so it's been very successful, in, but now, we are on the verge that we need something new. We need, uh, we need to take uh, responsibilities uh, uh, for the future. Uh, and, and I think COVID and, and the COVID vaccine has really you know, highlighted this in a way that's never been there. And the rapid, it's gone so quickly that so one year ago, this was, we didn't even think about it or, or uh, you know, a little bit more than one year. So in one way, uh, we have to also be a bit uh, careful here not to go too fast, even though it's in a sense there is an urgency, but uh, um, we, we, there's, there are so many uh, you know, interesting, and I, and I think the way that we have go, uh, that we come together uh, uh, is, is extraordinary. So in one way, uh, you know, I, I also think there's a lot of hope in, in, in the way that uh, uh, this pandemic ha has really shook the world, but there are uh, system issues that needs to be uh, 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 addressed. And, and, and I think particularly with, with uh, how uh, uh, capitalism uh, needs uh, to have some sort of moral added to it and, and take larger responsibilities. Otherwise, it's useless to die with a, a wallet full of money. Uh, 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 you know, if, it, if your children will not be able to, to live on this earth. So, so that's the larger perspective here, but 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 uh, I think it, it's very interesting how suddenly the world order and, and these issues have have, have uh, are on the on the table suddenly and so rapidly. Uh, there's been so many attempts because it's suddenly threatening us in the high income countries. I think it that is the main reason. Had it only affected the poorer part, we wouldn't have seen this. But now we're asking for solidarity from the people in Africa. So please get vaccinated to save us, and that's a totally new world order. And probably not a better one. <laughs> <laughs> Remember to send 100 krona to the Swedish Red Cross as well, please. But can, can I just come back to the issue of um, the intellectual property or rather its practical aspects? Because uh, I think Anders or Hampers both mentioned even with that, uh, the time it will take to build production capacity, quality control, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the question that comes in my mind, uh, I think symbolically, this might be very important, but will it in practice be able to, in the time frame that we see, actually reduce um, the, the pandemic in its current form and shape. And, and of course, we would have a strong focus on that. It's, um, has it been tested before? I think there was a, uh, there was a waiver on the previous um, IP vaccine, was it, some years ago? What was the experience of that one, if looking at today's problem? I don't, I don't think a waiver will be the only solution, but I think it's an important political signal, and I think it's absolutely necessary to invest in manufacturing capacity now, mm. even if it will take 12 or 18 months. Rwanda is ready, Senegal is ready, South Africa is ready, and that needs to happen now. And the IP waiver is, of course, just or having access to the intellectual property rights is just one thing. You need the technical support, tech transfer, you need the money, the logistics, as I said before. But it's not that only because it will take 12 or 18 months that you can just skip it and think that we just redistribute. You mm -hmm. need to do both. Good. Uh, just about this power sort of in between what Johan said in terms of Africa now that the, if you may say so, high income countries are now asking Africa to help. I think this is something very positive. 
because this changed the power game in some way. And I think that is something that we must sort of then make good use of. And African countries are making good use of this. So we are getting, I think, slowly into a situation where we have more equal partners around the table. Not, we're not there yet, but there's an opportunity now to have a different kind of discussion than what we had in the past. I think it's really interesting. Um, you have answered a lot of the questions that we had here. So we have just um, uh, kept the discussion going. There were some discussions or questions about uh, um, what other aspects will need to be changed um, for future pandemics. You've been discussing both uh, overall structural level, um, but also more specific areas. Um, and I think we have about five minutes to go now. And um, before the next pandemic, how can we improve um, vaccine equity, but also, I guess, as we've discussed from a broader perspective, global health and the equity uh, in health in the world today? Let's see, maybe- Can I continue on the, on the issue, not of vaccine, but uh, yes. a year ago, I think many of us had a lot of issues around the big pharma, which now we have forgotten and now we love them because of what they've shown that they are capable to do in a real emergency, pool their enormous scientific capability. And uh, some of them at least at lower cost than normal. Otherwise, um, medicines is a very big expenditure for countries. So is there an opportunity in all this also? I think one of you mentioned uh, that we need, is this an opportunity to, to improve capitalism by uh, expecting and working with these companies, just like we do with fossil fuel uh, uh, companies to actually take the lead in leading us into um, a, a better, more equitable healthcare system for the world. If, if there's something I wish out of this, and maybe it's a dream, but it seems to me that we have an example that we can set forward. Because talking about Africa, I think they have some of the worst examples of the consequences of the power of big pharma in the world. And here we see now a very different attitude that actually may uh, be very constructive for many of the health issues after that. The other thing I'm dreaming about, because I think you asked us, Hanna, is uh, a stronger WHO uh, with a sharp mandate, as Anders said, with uh, an upside to publish and uh, uh, to uh, make uh, real use of the uh, international health regulations and revise them upwards. Because that, uh, in my long work in international stage, I, I have seen, I don't know how many times, w, the enormous expertise of WHO being hampered by all kinds of almost invisible rules. So that's another thing I think would definitely help us in the future. Thank you, Margareta. I'll give the word to Hampus. Thanks, Anna. Uh, just very briefly, uh, in the interest of time, I mean, I, I, I think uh, the perspective that Johan brought up initially and, and, and the reference to Mariana Matsukato's excellent work in terms of rethinking not just health as a silo, as, as, as something we sort of do on the fringes as doctors and junior doctors and student, medical students and so on, but indeed a central objective of all of society. I mean, uh, health, promoting health is there in the, in the constitution of, of Sweden, you know, and, and most countries have the, the similar objective at the very core of what I guess Mariana Matsukato would talk about the, the, the basic values of, of society, right? So, so one of the basic values of society is is to improve health or maintain health or achieve the best possible level of health for the population. Um, so I think we're absolutely right to, to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, look up from, our, from our, our previous siloed approaches and really think about this in, in new innovative ways and rethink not just the health sector, but, but think about health in a much broader societal perspective uh, and, and dare to rethink some of the uh, sort of 
uh, truths that we've always held uh, about the, the 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 role of of society of 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 government of private sector and so on um, and try and forge a new path forward uh, for for the world. I think that that's that's really what we need and that's the level of ambition we need and and that's why I'm hopeful that the um, the audience here will will take the lead on doing that as as students and and, and junior doctors uh, for for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hampus. And um, it is now 8 p.m., but we would like to give Anders and Johan also a chance to just give a short wrap up. So, Anders, over to you. No, I'm fine. I really enjoyed the discussions and great to see everybody. Nothing more to add from my side. No, uh, from my perspective, I would just like to encourage you, uh, students out there uh, uh, listening to this, to go beyond uh, this pyjama uh, educate or, or training that we are, uh, uh, that the medical uh, training has become, that we are trained to work in a facility with everything available. We need to take off that pyjama uh, that you are working in and really to take on larger responsibilities. And I think, you know, um, the COVID pandemic, the vaccines uh, and all, it's, we doctors really have to be there uh, and to, as a specialist in the area, but also as, as somebody, uh, you know, uh, governing ethics in that sense, medical ethics, uh, we need to take on a larger role and be more engaged. So I really uh, would like to see you, uh, medical students and, and young doctors, to take take on this challenge and, and not only uh, reduce yourself to, to this pyjama profession, but uh, do, being a doctor is much, much more than, than than, than, than this type of, of facility-based uh, uh, delivering services. We have a role uh, in public health, in global health, and really uh, I would like to see more of you engaged and, and taking a stand here and highlighting, I think this is all about medical ethics somewhere, but on a global scale. So please uh, uh, engage and, and raise your voice and, and we need more of you. Thank you very much, Ivan, for those final and encouraging words and all the wonderful uh, engagement that you all have shown in this panel. It's been amazing. And I, I think uh, we thought this discussion could, have, could be short and brief and focused on the vaccine topic. But you realize uh, from what every one of you are saying that the issue is so complex and uh, there, there is no silver bullet, as Anders said, uh, for the solu solution of this pandemic and for the overall global health issues that we face and handling inequalities and achieving equity in health. Um, so it's been super interesting and I hope the audience has have enjoyed it as well. Um, for my, me, me personally, I think it is that Joanne just mentioned and Hampus brought up at the start that ethics is at the center of this and the human right to help. Um, I'm very glad that that was brought up uh, throughout this presentation. Anna, would you like to add anything before we end? Um, not much, just uh, to encourage all of you attendees that you can get engaged in SLSPUF if you would like to continue working on these issues. I think that many of us are now more inspired and encouraged than we were before, and I'm sure that we will continue to uh, work with that topic uh, throughout the year. Um, so please just um, send us an email if you're interested. And once again, I would like to thank all of our great panelists. We know that you are very busy at this time. So thank you for taking the time and sharing your experience in this area. And also there are quite a lot of people that would like to listen to this um, afterwards. So we will share uh, the um, uh, recording on our YouTube channel, the SLS YouTube channel. So uh, yes, that's that's all for me. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all of- Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you for Good. organizing. Thank, thank you. You can bombard us with emails as well. I think that's our role. <laughs> yes. uh, so, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs>
And we, we learned that there is something called the pyjama profession, which yes. um, uh, I was not aware of. <laughs> Do you mean that that pyjama profession is better at handling emails as well, or, or <laughs> how to dress for that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Have a good Have evening. Bye-bye. Nice okay. Bye-bye.